Hi everybody, today we're going to do a meditation that is actually more of a reflection and it'll be on the 12 deeds of the Buddha in order to reconnect with Buddha nature and in order to reconnect with joyous effort. And so listen to these 12 stages that you've heard many times before and just see if you can reconnect with a deeper meaning this time and use it as a way to motivate you for the rest of the day. And as always, we'll start with a few minutes of breathing meditation in order to let the surface distractions settle and to focus the mind. And so shift your focus to the breath. Buddhas manifest in many ways. An emanation body is a form body that can be met even by ordinary people. There are three types, supreme emanation bodies, artisan emanation bodies, and birth emanation bodies. A supreme emanation body must be identified as one emanated by a complete enjoyment body adorned with major and minor marks, which brings about the welfare of disciples through 12 deeds in various world systems such as this world. An example is the teacher of this era, Shakyamuni Buddha. The 12 deeds begin with a descent from the God realm. In the case of Shakyamuni Buddha, descent from the joyous pure land of Tashita. The Dharma transmission established by Shakyamuni Buddha had its beginning in ages past, when he took the vows of the Bodhisattva in the presence of the Buddha Dipankara and received a prediction of his future enlightenment. From that time forward, through countless lifetimes, the Bodhisattva trained himself in insight, meditation, and right conduct, continually perfecting his understanding and compassion. At last, transformed through eons of effort, he was reborn in the God realm of the 33, acclaimed in all the worlds as the coming Buddha. There he dwelt, instructing the gods and awaiting the time for his final rebirth. When the karma of living beings had ripened, all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions urged the Bodhisattva that the time had come for the deeds of a supreme Nirmanakaya, the physical manifestation of a Buddha, to be enacted in this world of Jampuvipa, the southern continent. As a place of birth, he chose Kapilavasta, capital city of the Shakyas, a people of the land south of what is now Nepal, and who enjoyed both prosperity and just laws. King Sodadana and Queen Maya, whose virtues and excellent qualities were without parallel, would be his parents. Imparting final teachings to the gods assembled for his departure, he removed from his head the crown worn by each future wheel-turning Buddha in succession and placed it on the head of the Bodhisattva Maitreya. What can you draw from the first part of this story? How the Buddha was once an ordinary being, and then a Bodhisattva, who developed his mind, who taught beings at a very high level until the karma assembled for beings at a lower level to be able to receive teachings to develop their minds. 
What thoughts arise when you think of this first deed, descent from the god realm? The second deed is conception, entry into his mother's womb. Before leaving the heaven of the thirty-three gods, Shakyamuni Buddha saw that it was fitting for him to be born from the womb of Queen Mahadevi, who in a previous life had prayed to be a mother of a Buddha. Following this, Queen Mahadevi dreamt that a six-tusked white elephant, symbol of wisdom and royal power, entered her womb through her right side at midnight. When Queen Mahadevi summoned the soothsayers to explain the meaning of the dream, they explained that her vision portended the birth of a great being. Her son would be distinguished by perfect beauty of feature and body, the 32 major and 80 minor marks of a great man. He would either rule the world as a universal monarch or win the perfect enlightenment of the Tathagatas, thereby opening the door to liberation for sentient beings in all the realms of existence. What do you draw from the fact that he was born from a womb of a human mother, intentionally taking a human life? What is particularly significant about a human life? as opposed to rebirth in one of the other realms. The third deed is intentional rebirth. In the case of Shakyamuni Buddha, birth in a Lumbini garden. One day as the time of the Bodhisattva's birth was approaching, Queen Mahadevi went to her retinue to visit the pleasure garden at Lumbini. As she reached out her right arm to touch the branch of a fig tree, the infant prince was born from her right side. The sky was suddenly filled with a magnificent array of offerings by the devas. Brahmas approached the child with offerings of exquisite muslin. The newborn child at once took seven steps in each direction, announcing that this was his last birth and proclaiming his intention to put an end to old age, sickness, and death. Gentle rains bathed the child, and as he walked, lotuses sprang up in full bloom beneath his feet. The king named his child Siddhartha, he who accomplishes all aims. Seven days after the birth, the queen passed away to be reborn in the Tushita heaven, and King Sodadana returned with his son to the palace. The sage Ashita came to the king's palace to seek out the cause of the many miraculous displays that accompanied the birth. Taking the infant in his arms, the ancient sage saw at once by the signs on the child's body that the new prince would become a fully enlightened Buddha. As Ita's Joy was tempered by sorrow as he wept knowing he would die without hearing the Enlightened One proclaim the Dhamma. Thinking about the benefit and the disadvantage of being born with your potential for greatness well known and anticipated. Fourth deed is worldly skills, the Buddha becoming skilled in arts and in playing sports. Siddhartha quickly proved a most extraordinary child. 
taken to school to study the five sciences and the art of writing, as befitted a future ruler, he proved to know far more than his teachers. When examined by the leading scholars of the kingdom, Siddhartha showed complete mastery of mathematics and of all known scripts in the realms of God and men. The king took care to shelter his son from all discomfort and unpleasantness, from every displeasing sight or disturbing topic. Despite his life of leisure and delight, the Bodhisattva soon saw that life is inextricably intertwined with suffering. While still a child, the young prince visited a farming village and was deeply moved by the suffering he saw. Withdrawing to the shade of a tree to meditate, he easily progressed through the four levels of dhyana, probing beneath the surface appearances to deeper levels of reality. As he grew to manhood, the Bodhisattva acceded to his father's wishes and sought out a wife. His choice was the princess Gopi Yoshodara, unsurpassed in beauty and in virtues. Before the marriage, the prince was asked to prove his worth in contests of knowledge, strength, and skill. Quickly he showed his complete mastery of the worldly arts, excelling without effort in archery, in wrestling, in every other sport and game. What meaning do you derive from the fact that the Buddha did learn all the worldly games, all sports, that he was proficient in science and math, that he was good at art, music, that he was married? The fifth deed is worldly pleasures, taking charge of a kingdom, having a great entourage. After his marriage, Siddhartha took up residence in the apartments of the women, living in luxury and ease. Everything in his life was directed towards pleasure. Everything invited distraction from spiritual concerns. Palaces for every season, food of every type, countless concubines, musicians, every luxury and comfort. But though he lived amidst the greatest delights, Siddhartha soon found the happiness surrounding him to be deceptive. He saw the shortcomings of desire, pain, frustration, and misery that followed in its wake. As his awareness deepened, the pain and suffering of those around him stood out with ever greater clarity, and his compassion deepened. He recognized the reoccurring pattern of decay in every life, the parting of friends, the fall of the powerful, the passing of youth, the exhaustion of riches. Siddhartha understood how people produce their own suffering through attachment and emotionality. The Bodhisattva's family and friends recalled the prophecy that he may leave home and become a Buddha. Ever more extravagant displays and entertainment were prepared for his enjoyment, but the prince no longer took any pleasure in such temporary amusements and distractions. Why might the Buddha have displayed the aspect in going into every type of sensory enjoyment, every type of mental entertainment, every samsaric pleasure? Why did he show this aspect to us? The sixth deed is renunciation. Upon going to the four gates of the city, becoming discouraged with cyclic existence, and due to that attitude, leaving the householder's life. The Bodhisattva rode out on from his palace on four successive occasions to visit the pleasure gardens outside the city. King Suddhodana had ordered that all signs of unhappiness and sorrow be hidden from the prince's eye. However, through the power of the Bodhisattva, four gods manifested before him, taking shape as images of the true condition of all beings. First came a man, bent and twisted by age. Next came a man in the grip of disease. Then came a lifeless corpse, surrounded by grieving mourners. Did all beings truly experience the pain of old age, sickness, and death, and yet do nothing to change their circumstances? Finally, a tranquil monk appeared, a renunciate whose mind was turned towards liberation. 
Seeing that this path was of benefit both to oneself and others, the prince resolved that he would do likewise. With the aid of the devas, the prince made his nocturnal escape from the pleasure palaces in Kenthaka, his favorite horse accompanied by his servant Chendaka. At the stupa of Kasyapa, built to honor the Buddhas of previous ages, he took off his jewels and donned the saffron robes of a mendicant. Taking his sword, he cut off the long hair that marked his princely status. Siddhartha vowed complete renunciation and assumed the life of a homeless monk. Think in particular about how awareness of and remembering suffering was the catalyst for the Buddha seeking a spiritual life. Is there a parallel in our own life? Or could there be? The seventh deed is austere extreme, practicing austerities for six years in the Naranjana River. Having put his former life behind, the Bodhisattva sought out the two greatest wise men of the day. Quickly he mastered their teachings and affirmed for himself that the knowledge they offered did not lead beyond the limits of samsara. Accompanied by five followers, the Bodhisattva traveled to the Naranjana River, whose beaches and shade trees offered many isolated spots for quiet contemplation and practice. Externally, the Bodhisattva took on the practice of austerities, for weeks at a time, he maintained the lotus position without moving. For years, he ate only one grain of rice, one sesame seed, or one berry each day. His body wasted away, and the golden radiance of his skin was transformed into a sickly pallor. Every bone of his emaciated body stood out against wrinkled skin. Siddhartha's inward experience, however, belied his outer appearance. Cultivating deep concentration, he spent his days in perfect samadhi. For within this perfect peace, he was always motivated by the unceasing compassion he felt for others. The Mahayana tradition says that during these years, the Bodhisattva received initiation from the Dhyani Buddhas and attained through countless samadhis the full inner realization of enlightenment. Only final initiation and the ceremony of realization under the Bodhi tree separated him from the perfect Tathagatas. Why did the Buddha show the aspect of practicing extreme deprivation? What was this to teach us? What did he learn through it? The eighth deed is the middle way, going to the Bodhi tree and meditating under it. When six years had passed, the Bodhisattva had shown that ascetic practices alone could never open the gates to liberation or awaken the compassion that leads to the highest enlightenment. He called to mind the time of his childhood when he had effortlessly passed through the four stages of meditation and determined to continue his practice in this way. First, however, he needed to nourish his body, to develop the strength needed to aid all beings. The maiden Sujata offered him, in a golden vessel, a special dish of cream and rice. This quickly restored Siddhartha's energy, his color and beauty returned. His five followers, watching their master's conduct, considered that he had weakened his vows. Turning from him, they departed. The Bodhisattva bathed and refreshed himself. He then walked inland to the side of the Bodhi tree, where each of the three previous Buddhas had attained full realizations. Siddhartha accepted some kusha grass from a young buffalo herder and made a seat for himself, saying, Here on this seat my body may shrivel up, my skin, my bones, my flesh may dissolve, but my body will not move from this very seat until I have obtained enlightenment, so difficult to obtain in the course of many kalpas. And just connect for a minute with this middle way approach. Away from indulgence, 
away from deprivation with strong, joyous effort and resolve to complete one's path. The ninth deed is the defeat of Mara, overcoming all the hosts of demons, inner and outer. The Bodhisattva sent forth a beam of light from his forehead, summoning Mara, the lord of the realm of desire, an embodiment of illusion, and warned him that his rule was about to end. Enraged, Mara sent his demons swarm to attack, just as they always do when their power is threatened by insight and resolve. At that very moment of realization, there is a final crisis, The full powers of the seeker's mind shine forth, and all the areas of darkness are illuminated. The chasm of utter negativity and the endless reaches of supreme bliss are simultaneously revealed. With his empire at stake, the Lord of Desires was roused to desperate efforts. Demons advanced on all sides with chilling howls and terrific eyes, spitting serpents, uprooting trees and mountains. The Bodhisattva remained in samadhi as demon forces charged. Eons of preparation and countless acts of compassion made him invincible. He effortlessly repelled all negativity, all thoughts of grasping, all forms of delusion. The demon's arrows and spears could not penetrate his body, changing to flowers as they neared him. Having failed to move the Bodhisattva by force, Mara sent his daughters to seduce him. But Siddhartha was indifferent to their charms. He saw the ugliness of the passion that lay beneath their beauty and under his gaze they became withered hags. In the end, Mara fled defeated. The power of illusion had been broken. What does this teach us? Who is Mara, really? The tenth deed is enlightenment, becoming fully enlightened on the fifteenth day of the fourth month. Having subdued all the Maras, enlightenment emerged of itself through the watches of the night. During the first watch, the Buddha saw with absolute clarity how all beings are born again and again in all realms of existence, in accord with their actions, their words, and their thoughts. In the second watch, he recalled his countless former lives, with complete awareness of every past action, its cause, its course, and its consequences. During the third watch of the night, with dawn approaching, the Bodhisattva saw that suffering has a cause, rooted in ignorance and governed by desire, and suffering itself will end when the cycle of causes is completely stopped. With the coming of dawn, his awareness broke through every limitation, Great compassion welled forth, and beings everywhere awoke to the potential for realization. The sun rose on a totally unique being, a Buddha, alone under the Bodhi tree. In great compassion, the Buddha resolved to impart the view and the path that leads to fulfillment. But who would understand the knowledge the Buddha stood ready to impart? The gods at once appeared before him, and a four-headed Brahma and Chakra pleaded with him to turn the wheel of Dharma. For the sake of those who otherwise would not attain realization, the Sugata consented to teach. Jubilant, the gods hailed the Buddha with a single voice. And so we consider why the Buddha might have not taught, and then what drove him to actually reveal what he had learned, to share the tools of his awakening. The eleventh deed is teaching, turning the wheel of Dharma on the fourth day of the sixth month. Following his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree at Bodhgaya, the Buddha traveled to Deer Park at Sarnath, the place where all the previous Buddhas had first turned the wheel of the Dharma, and where his five former followers were dwelling. Knowing that their understanding was well developed, the Buddha had chosen them as the proper audience for his first discourse. Seeing him approach, they decided to offer him no sign of respect, since he had abandoned the path of austerity. Yet as he came before them, the power of his realizations crumbled their resolve. He taught them that the way to liberation does not lie in the extremes of austerities or indulgence, but in the middle way, beyond all extremes. 
He explained the Four Noble Truths, suffering and the origin of suffering, the end of suffering, and the path that leads to the end of suffering. He set forth the Eightfold Path, the course of conduct that results in liberation from samsara. One by one, the five disciples attained realization. With heads bowed and palms joined, they formally sought permission to become the first members of the Sangha. The Buddha continued to teach for 45 years. Through his presence and his actions, he set an example of wisdom and compassion for all around him. The twelfth deed is the aspect of showing Paranirvana. In all, the Tathagata presented 84,000 teachings, a collection so vast that when written down, it is said to have required 500 elephants to carry it. The teachings that survive today make up only a small fraction of the whole of the Buddha's Dharma teachings. At length, the time came for the Buddha's final act. Gathering his disciples around him, he proceeded to Kushinagara. Reclining on his right side between two sala trees, he invited final questions from those around him and spoke for the last time of the impermanence of all things. Looking to no one other than yourself, hold fast to the truth as a lamp and a refuge. Mindful at every moment that all conditioned things are impermanent, seek your guidance with diligence. Surrounded by gods and demigods, bodhisattvas and disciples, he entered once more into samadhi and passed through the successive stages of meditation. Thunder was heard in the heavens, and as the earth shook to mark his passage, the Blessed One entered Paranavana. And so think to yourself, all of these deeds are potentialities within my own mind. There is an ordinary version of these I can explore within one ordinary life. There is a transcendent level I can explore life to life. The point being progress is possible when there is compassion, wisdom, and joyous effort. You can visualize the Buddha in this space in front of you, smiling directly at you, as well as holding in his gaze yourself and all sentient beings. It dissolves into light and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind, ripening the causes for your own enlightenment. And you can dedicate the virtue of this reflection for enlightenment ending with the Shakyamuni Buddha mantra. Daya, daya, Mune Amune Maha Amune Soha Taya Thanks everyone, see you online soon.